Hey everyone, it's Camper McDank here, and welcome to my Time Slitters 1 video. I've been interested in going back into playing this entry in the series, as I actually didn't play the first Time Slitters all too much. This would actually be my third or fourth time really sitting down and truly playing this, as I grew up with the later installments rather than this one, and as such, I don't really have much of a nostalgia lens to speak for this entry, unlike the other Time Slitters games I have looked at on this channel. Though it may have been due to the fact that the game originally released back on October 23rd, 2000, and was exclusively released for the PlayStation 2, which was developed by Free Radical Design and was published by Eidos Interactive. Now, I was someone who owned the GameCube primarily back then, and when it came to picking up another console alongside the GameCube, I ended up getting the original Xbox simply because of Halo. But yeah, now take this overview from someone who really doesn't have all that much prior experience with the first entry and is going in with a fresh set of eyes, so to speak. So yeah, why don't we go ahead and talk about the game's story mode, which, to give you guys and gals a heads up, we probably won't be talking about it for all too long, and you'll kind of see why that is. So Time Splitters doesn't exactly have an actual story really at all. The only thing you do with regards to the story mode is to simply travel to different time periods, playing as either a male or female character and looking for an object within that time period and taking it to an end goal. And that is for the most part located at the start of the level. Some levels have you going to a different location for the end goal, but for a majority of them, they simply have you tread back to where you first started in the level. Now the time periods that you travel to range from the years 1935 to 2035. You'll run through tombs that are littered with cultists as well as the undead, a chemical plant that has a SWAT team trying to stop you from collecting some jewels, a mansion that is cursed because of the presence of a murderer's remains alive within the mansion, which is causing zombies and mutants to populate the building, and even more different periods with different scenarios and settings that all are scattered throughout the story mode. When you come across the object and grab it, enemies that are known as the time splitters will begin to spawn in and try to stop you from getting back to the goal. These guys will bombard you, and at this point, it's simply a matter of running and gunning your way back to where you need to go. The difficulty in which you pick will also change how much of the level you will need to progress through in order to find the object in question, as well as changing the number of enemies in which you will encounter and their overall damage output. The tomb level is the best example of how much has changed up with regards to the difficulty. On easy, you'll have a starting weapon and the object isn't too far into the tombs. The amount of health pickups as well as armor pickups are fairly prevalent throughout the level when played on easy. When you kick it up to hard mode, not only do you not start with a weapon, you'll need to punch a cultist nearby in the face in order to obtain your first weapon. The level itself is expanded much further, having you fight through numerous amounts of enemies in order to get the object in question as well. You also aren't given many health pickups or armor pickups, so the game expects that you take out the enemies in the level without losing much of your health along the way, because if you aren't careful, you may not make it out alive. This kind of change up when you simply pick a different difficulty setting is something that I really do like, as it provides a different experience when replaying through the same level that you had played beforehand. Obviously it's going to be harder, but the way in which the game is designed is that it asks you to learn the level and find the best route to take the object and finish the level with just enough speed, as depending on how fast you complete the level, you'll earn a surplus of rewards and unlocks, with those being characters, cheats, maps, etc. You'll also unlock the challenge mode by completing the story mode, which we'll talk about later in the video, but just note how much there is with regards to the amount of content to unlock in just the story mode. Like, if you don't play through the story mode at all, you're missing quite a big portion of the game by not doing so. But yeah, the levels are for the most part alright. Though with regards to the difficulty, it kind of shifts up and down throughout the story mode. The first level in the game, Tomb, is certainly one of the trickiest, as it has you dealing with a large number of enemies, and the level itself is pretty long, so things can get rough when dealing with some of the enemies carrying blunderbusses or the mummies that require a headshot to be put down. Planet X is on another level where they can certainly throw quite a large number of enemies at you, especially when you pick up the object on the level, and then the game decides to spawn four to five enemies around you as soon as you pick up the object, as well as dealing with the numerous time splitters that are spawning and charging you down. And of course, who couldn't forget the mansion level, the most notorious level in the entire game by many others in the community, and it's not hard to see why. You're dealing with zombies that don't die easily as they require headshots to be taken out, much like with the zombies in the tomb level. But that's not the worst part of this level. There are also zombies that for some reason have the intelligence to be able to wield double barreled shotguns and do incredible amounts of damage even at the easiest setting in the game. These lads and lasses are littered almost everywhere in the level and at times around corners making traversing through the mansion just a process of peeking corners and hoping that they don't drop your health bar in seconds. What's worse is that they have the ability to fire off more than what the double barrel shotgun holds. Being completely unfair and it's just another way to end your run right then and there. Yeah, this level is easily the worst level in the entire story mode and is one of the hardest levels in the game. 
I mean, hey, I should stress this right now. Not all of the levels are this brutal. The docks level is pretty solid as you're given a fair amount of breathing room and thankfully have the means to deal with the enemies on this level. The Chinese level hosts a number of fun firefights that are pretty fun and engaging. The Cyber Den is another great level to run through, especially with the Assault Shotgun, which is super strong. I mean, damn, you take anyone out with it in one shot. But yeah, on the whole, the story mode is okay. There are definitely difficulty spikes that can bog down the experience from time to time, but there is something about running through the levels that kind of promote a speedrunner mentality that I really like. You're basically looking for ways to beat the level as fast as possible, which is aided by the fact that the levels are fairly short and don't ask you to do all that much else than to simply find the object you're looking for and run like hell to the exit. I will say, while it isn't my favorite campaign to sit through out of all the Time Splitters games, there is a reason why folks out there enjoy it and it has its own appeal. So with all of that wrapping up the story mode, why don't we go ahead and talk about the game's challenge mode? Now, Time Splitter's challenge mode is something that you have to unlock in the story mode in order for you to even be able to experience it in the first place. The challenge mode consists of various tasks and brief matches where you simply need to meet a quota, whether that be kills, points, etc. Now, there isn't any kind of trophy system that ranks you on how well you did. It's simply just meet the requirement that the mission asks you to do, and you're simply done. The unlocks for the mode simply comprise of more characters to play as, as well as cheats to pretty much dick around with. Now, the challenge mode has always been an alright addition, at least to me anyways, tasking the player to accomplish whatever kind of challenge the game throws at you. So what are my thoughts of the challenges in Time Splitters 1? Well, there are some that are fine, but then you got some really big stinkers in here. But first, let's cover the ones I personally had fun with. The flock around the duck challenge was pretty brainless, but at the same time pretty enjoyable to run around and basically be a wall, taking out any and all ducks that come across your path. The girls and boys challenge was pretty simple. You just had a team deathmatch where you simply needed a certain amount of kills, that being 80, and it's pretty straightforward. Then you've got the shop till you drop challenge, and it was pretty hectic to say at the very least. Having a pretty condensed section of the mall map where you would truck over to where the bag was and then bring it back to where your goal was, which was located next to the other competing teams. I like for what it was. Though now it's time to talk about the bad ones, and I'll just get the worst one out of the way to me anyways, and that was the Space Vandals Challenge, which wow, this was just awful to play through. I've read how people weren't able to beat this one, and I won't lie, it definitely set my expectations for the mission to be awful, but was surprised at how hard it was when I attempted it for myself. The goal is to simply guard four bases from the splitters and achieve a certain amount of points in order to pass the challenge. The way in which it's set up is that you have a turret nearby where you simply need to use it to its fullest capability and take out the time splitters who would simply love to have fun ruining your day. It doesn't seem too bad at first, but here's the thing. There are snipers that spawn in from a distance and from time to time, they'll take pot shots at the bases as well as having rounds where the splitters will simply spawn right next to the damn base and chip away at their health bars, which makes you frantically take them out as quickly as possible so that the bases don't lose too much health. And then you have the fact that you're also being swarmed by the splitters so quickly that you may not be able to keep them at bay from the bases fast enough, causing an immediate restart if things are messing up badly early on. It's not fun and I could never see myself beating this challenge in my younger years, that's for sure. And then you've got the challenge labeled Bodyguard, which is an escort mission on a short map, which you would think would be a breeze, but would end up being completely dead wrong. You get swarmed so easily and so fast that if you end up taking the fall during the escort, then it's basically an automatic mission restart, as the escortee's health bar drops off like a rock. The last one I'll mention with regards to challenges I didn't enjoy would be the Dusk of the Dead challenge, where you simply need to earn enough points to win it. So I didn't mention how zombies function with regards to this Time Splitters game in particular, but their melee attacks do insane damage to the point where you might actually just get one hit by them, and it's honestly the worst when it happens. The play area for this challenge is somewhat reasonable, but man, I would not stick too closely to the zombies. That's for f sure. I'll admit, out of the ones I listed as being brutally unfair at times, this one isn't that bad for some. However, for me, I just didn't enjoy it. I just wish you could take more than just one hit and a few more, which can happen at times, but you have to get really lucky. But yeah, overall, there are definitely some stinkers with regards to the challenges, but it's not all that bad when looking at everything on the whole. With all that said, let's go ahead and move on to talking about the game's multiplayer component and see what it has to offer. So Time Splitter's multiplayer component is able to provide a host of customization to anyone looking to get the most out of their multiplayer matches. Being able to change things such as the score limit, the ability to even start with a gun, having the radar be displayed in the corner, having one shot kills with any weapon, what type of bots you play against, how many bots you play against, what kind of weapons you want on the map, etc. 
Something that is quite a feat is the amount of characters on offer, which there are over 60 characters to pick and choose from. Of course, this is coming from the notion that you've completed all the other aspects of the game to unlock most, if not all, of these characters. And most of the characters are, for the most part, unique with their own intros and animations when you pick them on the character select screen. While there are some that use the same voice actor or actress and even having some of the same animations from other characters, they are visually different from one another. And something that I thought was really interesting was that with later Time Splitters games, they would actually have the characters be different from one another with regards to stats. And with this entry, there are actually no differences between the characters from a gameplay standpoint. They all play the same across the board with regards to stamina, speed, etc. The maps on offer while all the story levels are featured here in the multiplayer, with a few original maps made specifically or the multiplayer, they all play very well. There are some maps that even have game types tied to them that you can't even play on other maps that are on offer, which is interesting to see, but in a way it makes those maps unique to play, simply because those game modes can't be played on some of the other maps. And speaking of game modes, there aren't too many to talk about here. As always, you have the standard game modes such as Deathmatch, Capture the Bag, etc. But there are some modes that are unique to that of Time Splitters 1, such as Escort, where you have attackers and defenders, and it's the defender's job to escort an individual to the end of the map, while the attackers try to attempt and kill the escort before they make it. This can be a frustrating game mode at times, as the escort can take a dog's age to make it to where they need to be, and the players can drop pretty quickly from simple gunfire, making the escortee defenseless against the enemy team. It also doesn't help in my case, where since I'm playing with bots, they can sometimes just ignore the escortee and go off and do their own thing for no reason whatsoever. You also can't play on the attacker side of things, which is kind of odd, but I guess that's just how it'd be. You've got Knockout, where it's where the bags are placed in the center of the map and it's up to the teams to run in, grab the bags, and bring them back to their base. I actually don't mind playing this game mode, and it's surprising that this never made a comeback in any future Time Splitters game. It's chaotic and a lot of fun to me personally. Then there's Last End, and if I'll be honest, it's kind of a whatevs game mode for me. I will admit, thanks to the challenge that featured this game mode near the end, I am kind of sour towards it. But it's not all that interesting to me personally, but hey, if you like the game mode, then more power to you. So yeah, those are just some of the game modes I wanted to talk about here, as they are exclusive to this entry, and I feel that they should be highlighted here because of the fact that they aren't featured in any future Time Splitters game. Now with regards to talking about the weapons for Time Splitters 1, you've got the standard array of weapons such as the assault rifle, shotgun, sniper rifle, M16, minigun, oh yeah baby, rocket launcher, and your standard pistol. You also have some sci-fi based weapons such as the sci-fi handgun, sci-fi sniper rifle, ray gun, and the sci-fi auto rifle. You can also dual wield some weapons such as the M16, pretty much all of the pistols, shotguns, and oh, you can dual wield the minigun. That is one hell of a sight to see. You know, if I'll be real with you here, I don't really find myself using the snipers all too much because for me personally, most of the maps are built around fighting in relatively close spaces. So to use the sniper rifles in the game, I feel would put you at a huge disadvantage across the board. And you could make the argument for some maps where it may be more viable, but by and large for me, I didn't see the need to really switch them all too often. I mean, hey, let's be real here. The minigun is just a beast of a weapon and the fact that you can dual wield it is beyond insane. And I love every second of it, even if it's just a wee bit too powerful. The assault shotgun is an incredible shotgun as it could pretty much one shot everything at close to medium range. And I mean, you fire this thing off in rapid succession, so pretty much massive damage at fast speeds. The sci-fi assault rifle is another weapon that saw quite a bit of use from me, as not only can this thing dish out some seriously great damage with its primary mode, but its secondary mode is able to fire out plasma grenades, being able to take care of whatever situation it finds itself in, whether that be from long range or close range. And that's another thing about the weapons. Most of them have a primary and secondary fire mode. There are some that aren't all that useful, while others offer different means of firing it. It's not much, but a neat addition to give the weapon their own unique flair. But yeah, that's what I kind of wanted to cover with regards to the multiplayer, and it's still one of the more talked about aspects when Time Splitters is brought up, and for a good reason. The bots that you play against aid in this, as not only do they help keep the game's multiplayer an actual option for some who may not have others to play with, but also the fact that the bots are really well programmed and will take advantage of various things on the maps that you play on, as well as fighting and behaving like a normal player. I'm still impressed at how well they act even today when it comes to playing against them, as they're still fun to fight against. And hey, if you got friends who wouldn't mind playing a shooter from back then, you can play with up to four people at once on the same console, as long as you have the multi-tap, of course, which can be an insane amount of fun. But yeah, with all of that out of the way, why don't we go ahead and talk about the graphics and music for Time Splitters 1. 
Now, one look at this game and immediately the mindset would be for most is, wow, that looks dated. But that is to be expected, folks, since the game came out 20 years ago. And it's like, yeah, no shit, my guy. That's the sort of thing that you have to remember whenever you revisit a game way back when, when not everything is going to look all that pretty and there's going to be some ugly spots when looking at any piece of media. Something that I do admire with the presentation is the fact that the characters are fairly expressive and the visuals are, in a way, stylized, going for a comic book-like style, which can be seen if you look at the concept art for the game. The the environments look quite nice, with having a variety of settings to travel through, with each locale having a solid amount of detail to give these areas the right level of atmosphere they were going for. The mansion level, well shit, might as well be some folks' spookier FPS moments who have played it in their younger years. But yeah, while it is dated when looking at it today, it still holds a lot of charm with the character designs and animations to the unique and diverse environments that you travel through, whether they be in the future or in the past. The game itself also targets 60 FPS, which is awesome to see, and while there may be a few instances where it can dip below that, mainly in more spacious maps like, for example, Planet X, when it has a number of enemies appearing on screen, it is still able to hold that target frame rate most of the time playing the game, which should be commended. With regards to the music, well, it was composed by Graham Norgate, who does a pretty bang up job here. A lot of the music for Time Splitters could be considered to fit into genres such as electronica, progressive, techno, and much more. The music itself does a great job of not only providing great ambiance and atmosphere to the levels themselves, but also being fairly memorable as well. Here are just some of the tracks that, to me, I found myself enjoying quite extensively. Here, have a listen. <laughs> It's pretty solid stuff on the whole, and they're still great to listen to on their own from time to time. But yeah, overall, the visuals are charming, but definitely are outdated for sure, and the music is still bopping pretty well even now. Let's go ahead and move on to the game's map maker mode and go into a bit more detail about what it is. When it comes to the map maker for Time Slaters, it's a pretty solid addition to the overall game, allowing individuals to be able to create their own multiplayer maps to play against bots or even show off to their friends. You get a nice selection of tiles to play around with and have the ability to create different types of levels where you can duke it out with your friends or even play against the AI. Now, the creations in which you make here won't be on the same level as the maps already made for the game, but it is still a really neat inclusion to allow those to create whatever they like in this mode. You do, however, have a limit to how much you can put on the map, so do be mindful with how much you put on here as you will eventually run out if you decide to go overboard. Can't blame you if you do, I mean, who wouldn't, am I right? You can also change the lighting conditions to have the area stand out a bit more, so that way if you're playing with someone else, it'll be a little easier to make call-outs them, or if you want to create some more spooky areas and create perfect lighting conditions to match it. Or hey, if you want to go full-blown Crayola, then you can do that too. You are a bit limited when it comes to wherever you decide to place weapons or spawns down, as it only allows for certain parts of the tile for objects to be placed down upon. But I mean, hey, I'm sure you can make it work out in the end. You can also change the visuals of the tile set to allow for more of a visually different style to the map itself. But do note, if you do change the tile set, it will affect the entire map, so you won't be able to have certain sections of the map be a specific tile set. Now, this is pretty much the same thing that I've said on my other Time Splitters videos, but I will say again here, I am not the most well thought out map maker like some of the other guys and gals out there that have probably spent countless amounts of hours making incredible maps for people to check out. I did end up making a few maps on here, but I would highly encourage you to look up online some of the map creations people have made when it comes to using the map maker and Time Splitters. It's honestly great stuff and it showcases the amount of creativity that people have when creating their maps on here, or even in the other Time Splitters games. But yeah, on the whole, I always enjoy the Map Maker mode in the Time Splitters games, and while this rendition of Map Maker is more on the limited side of things, I still enjoy messing around in it and creating something that honestly turns out to be rather fun to play on. But that, everyone, is Time Splitters 1, the first entry in the Time Splitters series, and I gotta say, I found myself quite fond of the game as a whole. Yeah, sure, it's a bit dated visually, and it may be lacking when you compare it to the later entries, but on the whole, it's still a great first-person shooter that I think people could still pick up and enjoy, even today, 20 years on. The gameplay is still really satisfying to experience. The story mode, while it has its ups and downs with regards to difficulty, it still provides fast-paced action that isn't present with the later entries, giving it its own reason to come back to over the future installments. The multiplayer is still really fun to play, though, so if you were to ask me, I would probably jump on the future Time Splitters games as I think they provide a bit more for players to be able to play and tinker around with. 
but this entry does have some game modes that weren't present in the later installments, so there is that if you find yourself wanting to come back to this entry for that reason in particular. The map maker is certainly a bit ancient, and if I'll be honest, I would definitely utilize the map maker on the later installments, as like earlier with regards to the multiplayer, there's just more to work with and do that this entry doesn't have. But I can respect the fact that it laid out the groundwork for things to be expanded upon even further with the later entries. So yeah, on the whole, I like Time Splitters 1, but I think I would play the other entries more so than this one. But it's still a very fun game to play, and I would recommend you all to play it just to see how things started out with the very first entry. Alright everyone, that's gonna be it for me, and if you found yourself enjoying the video, then please be sure to leave a like, and hey, maybe you subscribe if you found yourself enjoying the type of content that I create here. The next video is certainly going to be on Halo 3, but obviously it isn't out yet at the time of this video being uploaded, so we'll need to wait until it comes out. But until then, I hope you guys and gals stay safe out there, and hope to see you guys in the next video. Catch you all next time.